taking some. I mean, it's just up for grabs. But. Oh, it's already open. Oh. Don't let them notice that. All right, so as we're getting started, if you want to follow along on your phone with the uh, slides, you can shoot the QR code. You can have it on your phone. Sunday, um, no life group next week. So, don't. did you hear the announcement? No. Uh, <laughs> but we are having the Easter sunrise service, so you can come for the sunrise service. Then you can go eat. Dorsey's going to take anybody who wants to eat out to Waffle House. He's got all the money. But um, then we'll come back to our worship time. So we are in 
Judges this morning. Uh, previously in Judges, we have been working through uh, the first section of the, of the prologue. <coughs> and I did not know that. And, uh, you know, the, the prologue works as this bridge that connects Joshua and, and Judges. Um, I like to look at it kind of like a previously in. That is, that is what the prologue works as. It's, it's saying, here's, you know, uh, Joshua said who, we had all these conquests of all this area. Here's what ended up happening. You know, it's kind of like a, a conclusion, a report of, of all those events. Um, it, uh, it opens with the death of Joshua. We follow the tribe of Judah in their, their victories. Um, they had this confederate alliance with the tribe of Simeon. And they've been successful in Zech, Jerusalem, Hebron, uh, Debir, and Hormah, all these different places. It's funny, you know, like when you're reading through it, it doesn't seem like there's that many battles. But there's quite there's quite a few battles in chapter 1. Um, but so they work their way all along the western foothills. And we've kind of been talking about our map the whole time, incorporating it in um, following it, you know, uh, the geography as we, as we work our way through the chapter. Um, and then at the end there last week, we, we went towards the, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the southwest coastal um, campaign with Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. And in that military report, we, we kind of have this uh, we have this reminder of, of Caleb and what it was you know, the, the ones who were following God, let's just say, the ones who were walking with God. And then we're introduced to Othniel, uh, who's our first Shabbat, our first uh, savior or judge. Uh, he's a military leader. He's a chieftain. By winning the battle of Debir, he wins the right to marry his wife, Axa, uh, Caleb's daughter. And uh, it's, it's the exact story that's laid out in Joshua 15. It's almost word for word, which is very strange. But it's, uh, it's, it's just as in detail there as it is here, you know, kind of showing the importance of it. I, I, like to, I always like to think the Bible tells me the same story twice. There's an important reason for it. Um, but so we've discussed that the author of the book is, uh, is anonymous. Um, and he is, at a minimum, living at a time after the events of the book. I mean, safely. <laughs> you know, um, the book spans 305 years, um, and he was not at these events. So I'll challenge you a little bit this morning. You know, I feel like every single time we come to church, we should be a little uncomfortable, you know? And so hopefully I'm going to introduce some uncomfortableness to the room, and we'll see. Um, but it, it is safe to say that he was not there during these events. He, it, the, it spans 305 years. Um, they didn't have that long life of uh, the early patriarchs. So he clearly wasn't at the events, you know. So they're handed down to him. Um, there's two ways you can, you can uh, accept that he's uh, received this information. One would be through oral tradition. Um, to say at a minimum that he had heard of these stories, that he had heard of these accounts is... Uh, pretty obvious. Um, and another way would be through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, God's, you know, spirit, uh, the spirit of God working through him, um, leading him to truth. Um, and, and those work si side by side. They work, they work completely together. Um, I'm not saying they don't. But I do feel like Especially in, in recounting these big things, you know, we've even discussed, you know, there's 10,000 enemy warriors on the field. Oh, no. Anyway, speaking of enemy warriors, anyway. Um, he's in a bad mood. He's not happy. Nothing he's bad. not happy. It's like mom, I'm three. Quit putting your there. Anyway, moving on. But there, there is this certain level of, um, of myth to these stories. That's a very uncomfortable word for us in church, you know. Uh, the first thing we think of myth is we think of fictional myth, you know. Um, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying myth is a traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of the people or explaining some natural or social phenomenon, and typically involving supernatural beings or events. Um, but it doesn't have to be. You know, uh, for us, I think as Americans, we have American myths. You know, we have uh, Pecos Bill, we have uh, Paul Bunyan. You know, these guys are they're, they're old guys. Um, <laughs> but um, and those are based completely in fiction. But at the same time, we he what he met Paul Bunyan. But at the same time, we have nonfiction myths. We have uh, Geronimo. Geronimo was in the battles that. You know, we say he was in. We have uh, Davy Crockett, you know. 
real man, uh, Johnny Appleseed, real man, planted orchards, you know, they're still there today. Um, and and there's, there's all kinds of different levels to myths, you know. Just by calling something a myth doesn't technically mean that it is false, that it is uh, fiction. It just means that there is this... There is, there is something to it that makes it bigger than, than what it is. An immediate, uh, so many times in sports, um, sports is full of myths, you know? Um, don't get me started on the old Chamberlain 100 point thing, but <laughs> many people believe that's a myth, you know? It's not, it's not on TV, it's not recorded, um, you know? So at the end of the game, they give him 100 points, they hold him, and, and <coughs> anyway. But there's so many, uh, there's so many myths in the same regard. Um, not tall tales like, like Band of Blue Ox or those kind of things, but even things that happened more recently. If you were to talk to Scott McCarthy about his senior year of football, he would tell you that there were several games he made every tackle. You know, <laughs> how can we prove this is not this is true or not true? You know, anyway. Um, but myth is a part of oral tradition as it continues on. It does have a way of getting larger than, than what it was in the first place. Is that what I'm saying is happening here? No. But I am saying there is some of that coupled in with, with some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So, handed down stories orally. Um, there you go. <laughs> There's no video of Scott McCarley's senior year just throwing that out there you know, on purpose. So, um, they won two state championships that year. Was that? Yeah, Smithsonian. Smithsonian. Anyway, back to what we talked about last week. We worked our way through those coastal cities over there in the land, um, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. And we said last week that these are three of the five Philistine cities. But the author doesn't mention the Philistines, which is very strange because we will encounter them before the end of the book. Um, by the time we get to chapter 19, we, the Philistines are everywhere. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a very interesting uh, detail of that area. In verse 20, the town of Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had promised. And Caleb drove out the people there who were descendants of the three sons of Anak. The people living there were descendants of the three previously named sons of Anak. So it wasn't his three sons. It was their descendants. Is another way to look at that. Um, Anak is uh, the Hebrew the Hebrew word Anak means the giant or giants, um, which is, oh, it changes the um, I like to look at it like um, if, if it were a title, it would be Andre Anik, Anik Andre the Giant, you know? Uh, so that's kind of how it reads, is when it says they're sons of Anik, they're sons of the giant. Um, so the Anakites are the giants. That's, that's another way of translating that. So if we flash back in the book of Numbers, Moses creates the scouting team. They're going to go recon the territory. They've already got all the way up there to the, to the promised land. Here they are. We're at the door. Uh, to go ahead in the promised land, he wants to create the scouting report. In uh, Numbers 13, verse 17, Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go, through the, go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like. And find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls? Are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile and poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land into the wilderness of Zim as far as uh, Rehob, near Lebo Hamath. Uh, going north, they passed through the Negev and arrived at Hebron, right here where we are, where uh, Haman, uh, Sheshai, and, and Talmai all descendants of Anak lived. The ancient town of Hebron, uh, of Hebron was founded seven years before the ancient city of uh, Zon. And so then, here we are right here in this exact place where we're trying to take back where they were at all these years before. Um, and then in verse 25 it says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them by the fruit that they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent, you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. 
people that living there were powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Ammon. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan River. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. And, and he does, which is a good part. But, um, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the land of the Israelites. The land we travel through and explore will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anna. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought, too. Um, the, the, uh, the actual Hebrew Bible there, um, verse 33 reads, We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites were a part of the Nephilim. And we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves, so we must have uh, looked at that to them. <coughs> Nephilim, we're all kind of familiar with that word. We all like to watch the YouTube uh, videos of the Nephilim back in Genesis before the flood. Um, but that's, that's who's in this land. The Anakites, the giants. So when Caleb went into Hebron, he, he defeated the, the three sons of Anak. That is who he's fighting against. Um, the same people that he said he could 38 <coughs> years before that. When they, were, when they went to you know the land and they, they did their scouting report, um, it was 38 years later when they actually come into the city. Um, it's just crazy, you know. That report, they come back, it forms this big rebellion. Um, it's kind of the sole reason why they're wandering around for 38 years. Um, it's because of that report of this region at that time. Um, the effects of the reconnaissance report affect the entire generation. But now, this is the region of the Philistines, uh, who are giants to the Hebrews. Um, there's a city on your map in the region of Judah named Gath. I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you, Gath is awesome. We're not going to be able to get there in Judges. But it's right above the word Samson. If you look at the word Samson, you can put a little dot right there. That's, that's where Gath is. Um, we will not read of the victory over the city of Gath. Because there is, no, there is no victory over the city of Gath. They're giants. 362 years later, after, this, after where we're at right here in Judges 1. 362 years later, the year 1063. There's a Hebrew boy who lives in the village of Bethlehem, just to the side there of Gath. He heads west towards Gath to the Valley of Allah. And he accepts the challenge of the champion of Gath. He defeats him in single combat, one-on-one, -on -one in the Valley of Elah. And in doing so, the Israelites take the city of Gath for the first time. Gath is missed in Joshua and the Judges, and, uh, and, and they leave it alone. Uh, the inhabitants of the land in the region of Judah are giants to the Israelites. I think that's something you need to keep in mind. That whole area there, when we were battling all those battles, especially those three cities at the end, those, those are giants. Um, I, I hope uh, your acceptance of the word giants there kind of, kind of challenges you a little bit. You know, it, it's, um, it, it's story and myth, I think, is a good way to look at it. Um, to feel the need um, to force a literal reading of the text here um, is good. Um, it, it, I don't know if it's good or bad. It, it, it's kind of what we do, though. I feel like we do that. It's the safe thing to do. When it says giants, they're giants, you know? But can I not say um, that Hunter, when I stand next to Hunter, he's a giant to me. I, I can say that. And, and, and it has the same effect, you know? Um, now, obviously, the Israelites at this time, their average height is, you know, five foot four, you know? So to be giants to them, you know, six foot five, seven foot guys are, they're giants, you know? Um, or you can take the literal reading see that um, in, in um, uh, 1 Samuel 17 that um, Goliath is 9 foot 9. You, you, can, you can take it how you want to. Nobody's arguing. Um, just, just throwing that out there. Just to, I, I think our goal, though, when we read the Bible is to find the author's intent. And the, his intent here is, um, for me, it's clear that, that they're giants. You know, speaking of, yeah, that, um, <laughs> How do you think the intended um, ancient audience received it? You know, that's, that's a good question, to take that information in. Um, one last verse here before we, uh, before we get started here. In Deuteronomy 9, this is Moses talking on behalf of God. Listen, O Israel, 
Today you're about to cross the Jordan River to take over the land belonging to the nations much greater and more powerful than you. They live in cities with walls that reach to the sky. The people are strong and tall, descendants of the famous Anakite giants. You've heard the saying, who can stand up to the Anakites? But recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out, just as the Lord has promised. After the Lord your God has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us the land because we're such good people. No, it's because of the wickedness of the other nations that he is pushing them out of your way. Now, when we read that, Moses speaking on behalf of God, do we believe or do we read that as those walls were reaching to the sky? Or where's the sky? That's not a good question to throw in there. But, you know, I, I, I think that he's, he's speaking a little metaphorically there. I think that's an okay thing to say. Um, clearly, there was an old saying of who can stand up to the Amalekites, you know, meaning, you know, just showing they're, they're tall, you know, just in that. Um, but I, I do feel like sometimes we have a, a forced literal reading that we put on things instead of looking for the point of what the author is saying. So with that, we're going to get started. We're going we're gonna to pray. We'll get into today's text. Dear Lord, uh, I just thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. We uh, thank you for this time that we have to open your word. We ask that you challenge and that you change us this morning um, as we as we uh, eat your word this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Um, all right. So, the remaining tribes. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, 21 through 29. I'm pretty sure, it's not 25, I'm pretty sure we're going to get through the rest of the chapter today. So, uh, those of you waiting to call the next page, we're probably going to get there today. Um, verse 21. Here we are in the, in the military report. We went through Judah, Simeon, and now we are to uh, the remaining tribes. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day, the Jebusites live in Jerusalem among the people of Benjamin. The descendants of Joseph attacked the town of Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And they sent men to scout out Bethel, formerly known as Luz, they confronted a man coming out of the town and said to him, Show us the way into the town, we will have mercy on you. So he showed them a way in, and they killed everyone in the town except that man and his family. Later the man moved to the land of the Hittites, where he built a town. He named it Luz, where it is to this day. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Bethshan, uh, Tanakh, Dor, Ibliam, Megiddo, and all the surrounding settlements because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that, piece, in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them, out, uh, them completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. So we have this, the rest of the report, these remaining tribes, and the author spent 20 verses uh, talking about Judah or Judah and Simeon um, and, and how they fared. And then here we are in these, you know, 21 through 29, talking about, focusing on um, the, the tribes of Rachel, which is uh, it's a much more distinct way of looking at it. Uh, they start with Benjamin. They start with the youngest um, and the smallest. Um, and then he works his way to the tribes of Joseph and then Manasseh and Ephraim. So here you are with, with the, the Rachel side of, of everything instead of the Leah. But the tribes of Benjamin, in verse 21, the tribes of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day, the Jebusites live in Jerusalem among the people of Jerusalem. And uh, the first fact is that the Benjamites failed to take, um, to take their territory. Um, Benjamin, being the youngest, his area is the smallest. Uh, on your maps, he's in orange. Um, and so technically, <coughs> Jerusalem is in Benjamin, although we've already had a battle there. Um, the Jebusites are still living there. If you remember in verse 8, Judah comes, they attack, they burn it down, they, they conquer it, and they've already lost it by verse 21. Um, so they, in verse 8, they said they attacked and captured it. It's really not very long. Um, the Jebusites are still there to this day. They said, and that's that's the author speaking to to his, his audience. 
Um, but it's, it's a good time stamp or time marker right there um, that clearly shows that this text was written before David conquers Jerusalem. Um, which, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a good timeline. There's, there's thousands of timeline markers in Judges. Um, that's a pretty good one. So then, after, after he covers that up, and, and you know, another thing is, like, we, we always think that, you know, of course they're going to be in charge of Jerusalem. But like, like we said last week, they're, they're never in charge of Jerusalem, you know? It's, um, it's unbelievable. But uh, the author then moves on to the tribes of, of Joseph um, uh, with Rachel. Um, the descendants of Joseph attacked the town of Bethel, and the Lord was with him. Then he sent men to scout out Bethel, formerly known as Luz. Uh, that's Luz. Um, the Lord is with the descendants of Joseph, uh, which is a crazy thing to say when almost in one sentence later, but they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it, it's very disconnecting for me, you know, because even when God says, if we go right now, we go over there, <coughs> I will give you victory if you do what I say. And they're like, yes, let's go. And then they don't do what he says. I mean, time and time again. Um, and then at the end of that little, of, of that little encounter, um, he includes his, uh, his third anecdote, which is uh, uh, another, another strange one. He sends these scouts out to Bethel, formerly known as, as Luz. And uh, they find this unnamed man. And they take him, they kidnap him. I don't know, it's just kind of a matter of opinion there. They hold him against his will, I would think it's kind of safe. Um, and, um, and they force him to help them. And then he gives them the key to the city. He gives them the secret way in. He gives them um, a way to overtake the city unnoticed. You know, um, Whether it's, hey, everybody takes a nap at 2.30 in the afternoon, or whether it's a, there's a tunnel, there's a, there's a hole up there in the, in the wall that I've been trying to get fixed, but we can't get somebody over to fix it. You know, I, However he shows them in, um, I like it. He, he hands them the keys to the city. You know, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, if you want to say that there's a, a large gate and he gives them the keys, that's fine. Um, however, they, uh, they then conquer the city through his help, um, which we know they're not supposed to do. It, it's an easy, even crazier thing. They spare this unnamed man who betrays his own city, the city of Bethel Luz, um, then that same unnamed man from Bethel Luz uh, moves to the land of the Hittites, and he builds a town, and he calls that town Luz. So it, essentially they're making a deal. They're making a treaty, which is like rule number one, do not make treaties. You know, um, if, you know, if you show us how to conquer Luz, we will treat you well. Back to Deuteronomy 7, which comes up time and time again, make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. Um, it's, it's time and time again, they break, they break that rule. Um, no treaties with the Canaanites. And here they are making a treaty. He, he betrays his own city, and he goes and he makes a new Luz. Um, Luz is a Canaanite name. And then, of course, Bethel is, is the Israelite name that replaces it. Um, uh, a super cool thing about this one for me, though, is that it doesn't happen at this time. That whole replacement system doesn't happen right here. It happened a long time, uh, 335 years before this. Um, you, you've got Jacob. He leaves Beersheba. He's going to Haran on, his, on your map there. He sets up camp one night. He, uh, he sees this uh, vision of a cigarette where the angels are going up and down uh, to heaven, and he sees this gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early, Genesis 28. He took the stone he had rested his head against, and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously named Luz. So in Genesis 28, we've already got, it's already renamed. Who renamed it? Jacob did. Um, Jacob renames it Luz. Uh, or he renames it Bethel from Luz. Uh, 300 and something years before this. So, but the end result here um, is uh, the, the tribes of, J of Rachel are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, clearly. Um, did, they, did they have some success? Yes. Um, <coughs> they end up living amongst the tribes of the Canaanites. Um, a very interesting comparison. Um, I don't think I put it on there. I have this cool chart thing, which I should have drawn. But um, when you talk about the anecdotes of, of the author of, of Judges, the two that are kind of highlighted right here for me are Adonai Bezek 
and and this unnamed man from Bethel was, and uh, they're so they're so weirdly comparable, um, yet opposites in some ways too. You um, their status is you've got this important figure with this title. He's he's the Lord of the Zek. He is the the leader of the Zek. Then you've got this unnamed man. Um, you've got him. He's this ruler of many. This guy. He's a traitor of his people. Um, their actions are you know Judah finds him. They. Uh, Fighting, they pursue him, they seize him. Whereas over here, they ask him, they negotiate with him, they let him go free, they spare his family. Whereas over here, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite. He's mutilated, he's deported, he's, he's uh, all, all these kind of things. Um, and then in the end, this guy loses his realm. He, he loses, you know, what he had. And this guy just moves to another site and makes a new one where, where he's, he's the boss, you know. Um, this guy loses his fingers, his toes. He loses his life, and, and this guy ends up building a city and probably, you know, continues his family. It's very, uh, it's a very strange comparison between the two uh, highlighted anecdotes there. Um, pretty neat. But so, uh, in verse twenty-seven through twenty-nine, we have uh, the tribes of Joseph, um, Manasseh, and Ephraim, and, and they're just not able to uh, to conquer the, the territory that they're supposed to. As, as we continue northward in, in the author, as, as he's laying this out, um, I'll start reading there in verse 27. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beth Shan, uh, Tanakh, Dor, Ibleam, Megiddo, and all the surrounding settlements. Because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them out completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. So we have the tribes of Joseph. Um, neither Manasseh or Ephraim were able to conquer their land. Uh, Manasseh's in yellow, um, and, and they, they grow stronger um, as they, after they've encountered them, and they take them and make them slaves. Um, so the Canaanites are still there, but they're there as slaves. And then Ephraim, which is purple, just right above that, um, which Gezer is on the border with Dan, um, although Dan's not mentioned yet, it will be in just a second. They continue to live with the Canaanites in Gezer. And so they have this continued life, but they're not setting themselves apart like they're supposed to. They're not uh, wiping the slate clean in their territory like they're supposed to. I will say, though, up until this point, they are going in and taking over the land, except for these cities that we named. You know, that's, that's really the way to look at it. Do they ever um, say in the scripture, like, you know, gosh, we're not, we're not uh, being successful. Maybe it's because we're uh, not, yes. not, I mean, I'm sure that we'll get into it more, but I'm just. No, that's, that's good. It's just kind of um, crazy how God tells them. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like he's laid it all out for them. He laid it all out, mm -hmm. and then they just, like, do their reach. That's us. That's this, us. This is us. So much, yeah. Chapter one's us. That's it. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. So yeah. much. Yeah. Um, no, that's exactly right. <coughs> we will get to that. Though. Although, even when the saviors come, even when uh, the Shofar team, the, the judges come, they're really not religious leaders. That's not what they are. And we'll, we'll discuss that as we go, but it's not really their purpose. Um, so, verse 30. Um, if there's anything I'll say before I read 30 through 36 here, closing out this chapter, it's man, you get a feel for the tone of, um, of, of how, we're, how we're just going down and down. It's, um, it's terrible. But anyway, um, there's so many repeated lines in here. For me, emphasizing you know the, the parts we're supposed to be paying attention to, clearly. Verse 30. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahalon. So the Canaanites continued to live among them. But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulon. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of Akko, Sidon, Alab, uh, Akzib, Helba, Atik, and Rahab. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land, but they failed to drive them out. Likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and 
left Anak. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anak were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount Harris, uh, Ajalon, and Shalbib. But when the descendants of Joseph came, became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. The boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Salah and continued upward from there. So, um, so the intended, um, the intended audience, the ancient audience, uh, they would read this section and, and see how sad this is. I, I, it's just we didn't get it done. We didn't get it done. I mean, we didn't get it done. Just over and over, the tribes do not follow God's instructions. They don't take the rightful land. They're not following through. They're taking the land or the region, but in these named cities, they're allowing the Canaanites to live among them. Then they're not even taking control of the territory and living among the Canaanites who control the land. So it's much, it's much worse as we continue on. And chapter 1 is really the setup for the whole book, and it's the exact same way where we start off and we're doing kind of all right. Hey, when, uh, who should we send out first? We should send out Judah. God says, here we come. He's with them. And it just, I mean, it, by the end of the chapter, the wheels have came off, and we, we, we're not even in control of our own territories anymore. Um, it makes it easier um, to see how it ends up the way it does. Um, one thing I'll say about the significance of chapter 1, though, um, is in this prologue, um, the application for the original audience. You know, that's what we should look for first. Um, and it sets up the events of the book. I, I think that's the thing to underline for us. All these events show the failure individually, individual tribes, and as a whole uh, for all of the Israelites. Um, with all these tribes and battles, there's only two mentions of God in, um, in the first chapter, which is you know, not Joshua. That's not the way Joshua's written. You know, Joshua, God's with us here, God's with us there. God, God's in every fourth verse almost. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, almost the opposite. In stark contrast, closing Joshua, turning the, the page to jo, uh, Judges 1. Um, this chapter is a summary of Israel's failure to take the land. Um, so then what's the modern application for us? Uh, this section gives us a lesson of how we relate to the world. How Israelites uh, related to the Canaanites is, is very similar to how we relate to the world. If we tolerate the world's values, we tolerate... Uh, if we let the world encroach into our lives before long, we will be living like the world. One thing to keep in mind is, as we read the book of Judges, is to, uh, the further you read into the book, the less distinguishable God's people are from the rest of the people. And, um, his goal is, in, in following what I tell you to do, I'm, I'm protecting you. I am setting you apart. And by the end, you you can't tell who's who. They're all they're all Canaanites. You know, the Canaanization of Israel. Um, for us, we have to be very careful how we are living in relationship to God and to the world around us. Uh, are we conquering the enemy in territories, or are we tolerating the world around us in our own lives? And I feel like that's the background. Um, you know, especially to chapter one, is the canonization of Israel. You know, their failure, which which is right there in the beginning. Um, or really, their failure is the whole book. But uh, the, the prologue is just focused on their failure. Um, and then next week, we'll start in chapter two, where chapter two is, I mean, it's a continuation of chapter one, but it's not, um, it, it's not, it doesn't have the same flow that chapter one does. Um the most obvious question in this section is what is wrong with Israel? Why, why, do, they not, why do they not just, hey, he's already told you what to do, you know? Um, I do think if we'd only read chapter 1, we would think um, it, that they can't take care of the Canaanites. That would be their number one problem, you know? But man, in chapter 2, once we, once we find out our real problems, we, uh, it's, uh, it's much different. Uh, I think, I think we're, it's easier to see uh, why they don't conquer. Uh, why they can't you know, win these battles. Uh, and another thing, if there's a 
way to think about the Israelites in any battle. They don't, they don't need weapons. You know what I'm saying? They do not need weapons. That is uh, them relying on themselves. Uh, and so when you read the Bible like that, when you, when you read they were at Jericho and, and they were weaponless, uh, they don't need weapons to beat Adonai, Bezek, and Bezek. You know, that's, that's the way you should... It's, it's through their belief God will give them victory. Um, but, so, in ver- and so, right there in chapter 1, we talk about this report, this military performance, how they did, they did terrible. Chapter 2, we talk about the theological significance. What is, what is their relationship with God? How is it just uh, falling apart, getting worse and worse? Um, and then um, we'll, we'll go from there. I do, I do feel like chapters 1 and 2, though, it's kind of like this two-sided coin where you see it like this. You, you see, you know, they're not getting this done, and then, and then you kind of see why. Um, the other side, you know, the, the, their relationship with God. Uh, the first shows their failure. The second explains God was, God's response to that failure. So, anybody got any, um, any thoughts, any uh, comments or questions on anything? I would like starting off strong and big on it. You know, I think a lot of times, even like when we come in here on Sunday and we get so pumped up and the message or the lesson speaks to our heart and we have the best intentions to have the best week and to really set aside our time for God, to really, really pray for others, you know, just really start off strong. And as the week goes on and as you get knocked down by life or whatever, it, you know, we all have different things. It's very easy to um, totally get off track, try to make decisions on your own. Um, as you get tired or whatever's going on, discouraged, then you maybe not, you know, you don't spend the time with God like you should, et cetera, et cetera. And then before, before you know it, you're just losing the whole battle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's so important. And I, I don't think everybody in here feels the same way about that. Yeah. It's just so easy. To, uh, to have a New Year's resolution yes. of I'm going to quit eating donuts before church. Yes. But and then I'm eating church. donuts and before then, church, you know? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah. we, we didn't tell you those donuts. Oh, it's on purpose. Anyway, but yeah. like that, you know. It's it, very relatable. And yes. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've already spent three months on this New Year's resolution. Well, you know, um, I'm not seeing any results. I quit. Uh, the results are not what I want, or I just want to do my own thing, is, a, is another way of looking at it. Um, I don't know, it's, it's so sad to me, um, but it, it does better help us understand the Israelites themselves as if we see them as ourselves. You know, they are just people, you know. Um, you would be thinking, though, like Caleb, for example, Caleb was there with Moses, like he's seen God's power in front of him. How could he lose, you know, that that excitement? Well, this generation is, is old now. They're, they're passing away, and here we are with this next group, and they're already, you know. Do you, you notice also how quickly they forget what it was to be like a slave, to be a slave, mm-hmm. and they make oh, slaves? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. How fast they, they yeah. like, two generations, three generations, and they have slaves. Which is, which is how we should read this also. We should read this as a shock. These people, it's like they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh-huh. Um, uh, absolutely not. I think when you're like, in the moment, and you're in a, you don't recognize, but if we were to write a book of our lives, and people were living here thousands of years from now, they're going to look back and go, like, these people were stupid. They didn't see God's work in them. This person was ill. This person, and like, we're doing, you know, we get things, or doctors, we don't, all these things that happen, we don't. I don't like all these good things to God. Oh, uh, that's a very good point. It's true, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely. We've always been like that. I think later on, they'll definitely look back and see the mistakes of this generation of this time. Uh, I think I've seen the mistakes of this country and the, the downfall and the things that are happening too. Um, as as we seem to get further and further away from God, and we don't know. Oh, absolutely. I, I think every generation. Sees yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, that's true. yeah. Uh, I think that's a historically, you know, it's just, yeah. safe. That's yeah. true. They don't know how to, we, my generation, we know how to do that through hard work, you know. Yeah, we used to have to stand up to turn the channel. Oh, right. Yeah, um, <laughs> we had it rough, you know. Um, okay. Commercial.
first. You couldn't pass it. <laughs> anyway. No, I think there's a lot to be uh, to be taken in there. Um, Who knows for eight dollars a word? Kevin. Well, I mean, they're. I listened to him rant to me a bunch of times. I still mispronounced all of them. But um, there's so many different ways to pronounce them. I, I don't know. 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 I don't
For me, you know, I always like to, to pick on myself a little bit. And I will tell you, when I was 25 years old, I took the literal meaning of every single line, you know. So uh, when um, God says in Deuteronomy 7 that, the, uh, that their walls reach to the sky, those were some tall walls. You know what I'm saying? Like they were, I don't know, 100 foot high, 100 foot high or something, you know. Until the invention of the newspaper, we didn't read things for the details and, and for everything to be uh, provable up, up to the exact, you know, account. The account is not a, that's not the, the reason, you know, the Bible's written. The Bible's written to teach you about God. That's the, that's the, the point of it. Not to give a second for second account of, of you know, the lives of, and events of the people in the Bible. I think that's something to keep in mind. All right, very good. I'll, uh, I'll start off with that next time. Yeah. 